Hi everyone, my name is Nikola Kozakowski from the Medical University of uh, Vienna in Austria and I'm glad to launch a new series of webinars with the collaboration of the Renal Pathology Society and Glamcon. Welcome Dr. Vines and thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me. It's always exciting to talk about this topic, which is very close to my heart and my soul. I really I uh, think that this brought me into renal pathology, being a protocyte biologist, so I really enjoy talking about this topic. So without further ado, let me share my slides. Can everybody see them? Well, can you see them? Yes, excellent. Okay, good. Okay. <laughs> All right. So I divided my talk into... Um, two sections. The first section is um, just to talk a little bit about the background of what we know about photocytopathies and uh, what brought me into this whole field and why I think it's a very important topic to do research on and uh, sort of go over unmet needs in this area and why it is important that we understand the pathophysiology behind uh, photocytopathies and the pathomechanism. <clears throat> and the other, th the other half of the talk, I'm just going to show you some cases where we sort of can apply a little bit what we know now about protocytopathies in order to understand them better and to treat them uh, much better and in a more targeted way. So I did a few months ago, I did a little unofficial survey on Twitter. Um, what is the worst morphology-based diagnostic term used in renal pathology? And really the two that came out on top other than MPGN, which I'm not gonna talk about today, were primary, idi idiopathic, secondary, any form of focal and segmental glomerulosclerosis. And, you know, the comments here listed are, you know, FSGS, it could be a lot of things. Idiopathic in the diagnosis means the pathologist is an idiot. Well, you know, uh, let's let that stand here. Uh, it may not just be the pathologist who uses this term. Isn't every FSGS secondary? Sure, there's some truth to that, as you will see um, in the course of my talk. And also a comment, we hide behind a widely accepted fact that we don't know what the cause is. And this is really kind of too bad that we call something idiopathic whenever we have no idea what causes it, just because it sounds more fancy than just saying, shrug, I have no idea um, what's going on with you. And uh, the other term that came on came out pretty much on top was minimal change disease. And there was a, a huge pushback from patients saying, my friend has minimal change disease, or I have minimal change disease. How can that be a name for a disease? He gained 40 pounds. That's kind of a big change, right? So these patients are sick. And to call something minimal change disease can be a little bit, you know, offensive to some patients. And then from a medical um, perspective, minimal change is, is a very reductionist term to describe a condition that really affects children and families dealing with idiopathic nephrotic syndrome very significantly. And so I think this is reason enough on its own to try to understand more about these conditions and try to help um, rename them potentially, give them a new name that's actually based on etiology and not based on what we see or based on how people behave with this disease. So in order to really understand where these terms are coming from, we have to kind of go back uh, a number of years, back into the pre-biopsy era in sort of the you know first half of the, um, the 20th century. Um, this is the first edition of the book Pathology of the Kidney by Robert Heptonstall. I'm sure everybody is familiar with this book. It's really one of the most um, comprehensive textbooks of renal pathology. Uh, the first edition came out in 1966. And so that was just when, you know, we started doing some biopsies in kidneys. So all of our knowledge that we had acquired before that was basic, basically based on autopsy material. And that's very important to understand these terms of FSGS um, and minimal change disease, because all we had available were patients that were very sick and potentially died from this disease. And uh, so they were pretty far advanced in whatever they had. They were either extremely nephrotic and sick, or they were in basically end-stage kidney disease when they passed away. Um, so what they observed in the original histologic workups of these patients, um, which were based entirely on light microscopy because we didn't have IF and we didn't have EM at the time, um, that there were a lot of lipoid casts in there. There was a lot of lipid in the tubules, so they called this condition lipoid nephrosis. Um, and that was a term that lasted for quite a while for the nephrotic condition. And sometimes, you know, there was a little...